to see you. I am uh, here to talk about this book. I'm the author. My name is Roshanak Keshti. I want to start by thanking Trevor, um, who was really, you know, receptive to the idea. And uh, I'm just going to play a little bit, read, and hopefully we can have a conversation. Um, so before I start reading, um, I thought maybe I would give a little context to how this book ever came into the world. Um, it's been a few years in the making. Um, I am a professor, but I am not a professor of this instrument, so it's kind of an uh, unexpected thing. I had to convince my, the chair of my department that this was a book that should matter. Um, so I uh, had on my bucket list that at some point in my life I would write a book about Wendy Carlos. Um, and the opportunity arose uh, in 2000, I want to say 10. Um, when I met the then editor of uh, this series called 33 and a Third, which used to be on a publisher, uh, pr published by um, a publishing house called Continuum. Um, and uh, her name is Ali Jane Grossan. Uh, she was very excited to... Um, recruit me to write a book and so I said I want to write a book about this album called Switched on Bach. Um, she is probably I would say at least 20 years younger than me and so she said I don't know what that is but sure whatever. Um, and so later about two days later she emails me very eagerly and says, please write a book about that album. I, I learned about that album. I talked to some people about that album. I want you to write a book about that album. So uh, several years passed, um, and the book that I thought I was going to write um, transformed into this. And uh, I am very excited um, to read from it to you today. Um, it's about... The book is two weeks old, so um, it's, you know, still pink 
Um, and uh, also, I thought I would play some of the, I would demonstrate some of the things that I'm talking about in the book. So um, I can play a little bit more later um, if you're interested in just hearing this instrument. Um, but I, I, what I really wanted to do was demonstrate some of the concepts that I, that I talk about in the book. Okay. Okay. Chapter one. The Original Synth. Wendy Carlos is the original synth, declares the gleaming banner that opens the biogra biography page on Carlos's expansive website, proclaiming an identity for a figure notorious for disidentifying with proclamations made by journalists and scholars about her. In the evolution of the concept synthesize, the preoccupations of modernity a mastery and control over nature, became superimposed on a concept that originated as making anew. Having perhaps grown tired of the cursory mentions of her role in the history of electronic music, none of which seemed to recognize her foundational presence, Wendy Carlos reclaimed that original meaning when she coined a new moniker for herself, original synth. Like a plaque certifying the authenticity of the biography page it frames, the claim original synth establishes electronic sound synthesis as an oxymoron, while also laying claim to it as an identity. If an oxymoron, as the Oxford English Dictionary defines it, is a figure of speech in which a pair of opposed or markedly contradictory terms are placed in conjunction for emphasis, then original synth reveals through juxtaposition that origins are synthetic. They are artificial and manufactured, yet necessary myths made real for the purposes of rationalizing the present. Yet the phrase also subtly points to the original meaning of synthesize, the deeply human act of creating new knowledge, revealing the contradictions inherent to a reading of electronic music as that which is artificial and in direct opposition to the natural sounds of the acoustic. And so for those of you who, who, who play electronic music and know electronic music, you're familiar with that, that, you know, or that kind of characterization of electronic music as, as not natural. Original synth is also a pun riffing on the Christian origin myth in which the desire for knowledge and the knowledge of desire in the allegorical form of Eve's feminine sexuality narratively function as Christian man's downfall. This playful, punful decree could refer to the obsession journalists have, journalists have had with Carlos's gender identity. It could also be read as representing an experience characteristic of the times to which Switch Dombach became a soundtrack. The oxymoron of a post-war world defined at once by civil rights and post-colonial liberation struggles and the apocalyptic scenes of war. So this album came out in 1968. After all, the arc of Carlos's career reveals her to be a composer of film scores, Switch Dombach being perhaps the first. To imagine Switched on Bach, which I will just call SOB from now on, uh, as a soundtrack to a moment is to think of it as both a sound of a moment and a sound making that moment meaningful. When Carlos embarked on her career as an electroacoustic music composer in the 1950s, the instruments at her disposal were machines designed to serve the Cold War agenda and the figures who dominated this avant-garde musical movement were men. After a chance encounter with a young Bob Moog who was presenting a prototype of his synthesizer at the 1964 Audio Engineering Society conference, Carlos would go on to collaborate with Moog on developing a custom unit, which would change the course of electronic music history. The chance encounter, the ties to war industries, and the unlikely propulsion to superstardom and pop iconicity set Carlos's career on a course no one could have dreamed. The spotlight and the at times unwanted attention that came with it 
caused Carlos to reject claims circulating about, about her and retreat to a private life. Carlos would eventually reemerge from that retreat as original synth. The oxymoronic identity original synth, evoking the image that Carlos herself was the instrument, presents us with a seeming, con seeming contradiction. Wendy Carlos was for me, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to stop there. Agitated with the political dead ends of, uh, of, of, of feminism um, in the 1980s, Donna Haraway, who is one of my professors, coined a, a concept known as uh, the cyborg, the feminist cyborg. Haraway presents the cyborg as a figure that encapsulates the contradictions inherent to living in a postmodern era where all materials, politics, and ideas are polluted. Wendy Carlos was, for me, a cyborgian goddess who shepherded my self-discovery through the Moog synthesizer. As a young queer musician in a scene dominated by straight white men, I became aware of Carlos's influential place in electronic music history at a time when I felt I was the lone woman synthesist. The hidden history of her role in bringing the Moog synthesizer on its circuitous path to me was critical to how I would come to relate to the instrument and its gendering. Wendy Carlos was also the cyborgian goddess that pop music was waiting for in 1968 when she, ush when she ushered in the popularity and cult status of a then obscure musical instrument with SOB. This platinum selling album won three Grammy Awards in 1969, entered the top 40 charts, stayed there for 17 weeks, and remained in the top selling 200 albums for a year. The declaration Wendy Carlos is the original synth lays claim to being both a Wendy and an original synth, an intersectional embodiment that represents what I call a synth gender. Synth gender draws our attention to the gender identity disorder inherent to electronic music. It chronicles the hostile takeover of the sonic realm by fascists and warmongers after capitalists had deliberately feminized sound in the late 19th century through the domestication of the piano, which became a tool for the performance of Victorian womanhood, the phonograph, and even audio recording. And if you're curious about what I'm talking about, it's described further in the book. Haraway's original provocation of cyborg created space for an entity that collapsed, collapsed the boundaries between nature, culture, and technology. Rather than doing away with any of these categories, her cyborg synthesizes them. Similarly, synth gender is not just a futurist utopian wish. It is a gender ontology that moves across time, form, and space through sound. Unlike cisgender, which often describes perceived gender conformity, synth gender merges sound and gender and refuses normative gender legibility. To be an original synth is to dispense with the binary gendering of electronic music over the course of its technological history. Synth gender employs a gender noise to refute the listener's wish for gender legibility. Synth gender also rejects any primacy given to originals, so-called originals and analogs are equals. Not only does synth gender reflect a musician who changes as a result of being entangled with her synthesizer, but it changes the instrument, which becomes tainted or elevated by the musician. These entities become mutually constituted as a synth gendered agency. They become synthesized. Uh, moving on to chapter two, which is called Switching On. To switch on is to electrify. So much of music has been transformed by this 20th century technological ubiquity. Switching on is a fundamentally modern kinesthetic act that automates a function, like labor, resulting in more time exertion elsewhere, 
that is, in states of leisure, rest, consumption, play, or more labor. In the mid-19th century, Karl Marx predicted not only that automation could harm the worker if capitalist interests maximize production through automation at the expense of human interests, but also that it could ultimately result in the obsolescence uh, of the human. The anxiety around automation became attached to the synthesizer in the mid 20th century. The kinesthetic act of music making, the strike of a hammer against a string, the strum, the anthropomorphized heartbeat of a drum, seemed to be at risk of being replaced by electricity, the very literalization of abstract power. Electrical voltage as a source for music, the very stuff of science fiction. The twilight zone of a post-nuclear world seemed to be descending in the form of the synthesizer, an electrical instrument with the power to shift shape. Switching on musical instruments, as opposed to large assembly line machinery, distinguished a generation of youth from their parents, a distinction further indexed by dress, music, dance forms, and cinema. By 1968, when Columbia Records released an album called Switched on Bach, consisting of 12 pieces by the 18th century classical composer Johann Sebastian Bach, performed on a Moog synthesizer, the switched on generation embraced it as a kind of soundtrack to their lives. Accumulating Grammy Awards and dominating the pop music charts for years to come, SOB exceeded all expectations and spawned a new subgenre of Moog-centric interpretations of any and all forms of popular music. So you can find a Moog um, record that interprets every genre of music in the 1970s. So there's like an, an album that I have is called um, uh, Moog Goes to the Opry House, and it's a country music record album on the Moog. Uh, prior to 1995, like anyone else, I had been drawn to electroacoustic or electrified instruments like the electric guitar or the electric piano. But upon my first encounter with analog synthesizers, I recognized the novelty and distinction of their sound production technology. Whereas electroacoustic instruments employ pickups to convert the vibration of strings into electrical signals, which can then be manipulated in infinite ways, the analog synthesizer generates its own tones, which can then also be manipulated in infinite ways. In simpler terms, electrified instruments create and capture resonance. Sound is an interaction with its environment, that is a string vibrating within the hollow of a guitar, for example, whereas the synthesizer creates sound from electricity. The sound of electricity is synthesized through the manipulation of various qualities, like envelope, frequency, waveform, pitch, etc. What the synthesizer enables the musician to do is, is play within these shifts. It is a machine that satisfies a will to shift shape. Okay, so so one of the um, one of the ways that that synthesis is described um, is that it allows you to manipulate wave shape. Okay, so some of you probably know this. So when you're playing, you can. <laughs> Okay, so the next section is called, and, and you know, I'm an academic, and academics love parentheses. Okay, it's a very strange thing about us, and we love to put a lot of things inside parentheses. Okay, so that's what I'm doing here. It's called on parenthesis, 
modular, phase, pitch, paradigm shifting, and close parentheses, the will to shift shape. Shape Shape shifting is a timeless and universal wish. Traceable across cultures, religions, and time periods, it represents a desire for a transcendence of the body, time, and space, the wish for metamorphosis. From Greek mythology to Marvel comics, Shapeshifting has allured Homo sapiens, sapiens, I'm an anthropologist, so I have, to, I have to use that in every book I write, has allured Homo sapiens, sapiens, as long as the archeological record extends. The pre-Christian and early modern icons of, of shapeshifting, such as sorcery, alchemy, chimeras, magic, spirits, voodoo, hoodoo, ghosts, etc become pivotal to the paradigm shift to the Christian and colonial eras. Jesus' resurrection comes to figure as exceptional and hence definitive of his divine power, and an end is declared to the more commonplace everyday forms of shape-shifting claimed by commoners. The mythos of resurrection elevated the birth and resurrection of Christ to the preeminent form of shape-shifting, rendering sorcery and magic as base and inauthentic. Nevertheless, shape-shifting has remained central to lore, superstition, and a variety of genres of storytelling. It is the means by which the unknown and otherworldly is imagined, engaged, and embodied. Its ubiquity across cultures and time periods suggests it is one of the driving forces of modern human beings akin to what Nietzsche defined as the will to power, what Freud described through the pleasure principle as the will to pleasure, and what Foucault's emphasis on discourse interpreted as modern government's will to knowledge. It organized the world into hierarchies. A will to shift shape represents the human wish to alter existence, either physically or temporally. The Moog synthesizer well, not just Moog, you can buy any synthesizer. Um, the Moog synthesizer is one answer to this timeless will. On the one hand, all music is shape-shifting. Timbre, color, scale, rhythm, and the body's response to these forces, these are performative shape-shifting energies. But in the analog synthesizer's electronic medium, sawtooth, sign, and square waveforms can literally be changed by the musician through voltage variation, translating as different rhythmic pulses of energy and sound, a literal shifting of wave shape. In Wendy Carlos's hands, shape shifting on the Moog resulted in what she calls orchestration, or the painstaking work of synthesizing sounds that are analogs of acoustic ones, transforming a simple square wave into color and sonic timbre through the introduction of variables like changes in in the envelope, uh, which is the signal's attack and decay, Uh, voltage controlled oscillators. So the 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 various uh, oscillators I have here, which you know I'm sure they're way more elaborate oscillators, but on this And pitch. That was the end of that sentence. Um, I think everyone knows what pitch is. Um, Electronic orchestration could easily be and often is interpreted as an artificial mimicry of acoustic sound. 
But this misinterpretation is akin to the designation of photography and painting as simply miming rather than creating new representations of the world. As engineer and producer Rachel Elkind put it, quote, we were after a vocabulary of synthesizer sounds that might be analogous to the sounds that have become part of the standard orchestral language, but on the synthesizer's own terms, unquote. Continuing, quote, of course, there's musicianship involved too. It's not as contrived as it seems when you envision each performance as beginning with a click track, but, but we work until it sounds loose and spontaneous. That's the trick the magic of synthesizer tape performance." Unquote. Carlos's orchestration of sounds for SOB employ a realist sonic aesthetic to represent the instruments in Bach's original compositions, but does so in a manner that is productive rather than mimetic. The first track on SOB, an interpretation of Bach's Symphonia Tocantata No. 29, which was originally composed for pipe organ, which is typically found in a large resonant cathedral, is very distinctly mogi and clearly not meant to simply mimic the organ. It is, a, it is paradigmatically contrapuntal electronic Baroque. God the Christian Father appears wearing Africa Bombada's shades, reciting the book of Genesis on the far left channel, while the world erupts in hypercolor fractals and furling like a Prince guitar solo on the far right. The infamous low end of the Moog, described as having the deepest, widest, most robust synthesized bass sounds, is a constant here, as is the brightness for, in, for which the instrument is known. Carlos and Elkin's instrumental orchestrations are not reflections of the instruments for which Bach composed, Instead, Carlos's orchestrations are symf of symphonic sounds represent an interaction between so many forces, including the collaboration between Elkind and Carlos and, and Benjamin Folkman. Um, these were the three main um, kind of orchestrators of the record. Uh, the period of Moog technology, so um, the instrument that was used as a part of this early um, 900 series, and um, these were uh, very um, small uh, units that had to be assembled and then patched together. Um, and it didn't allow for the same amount of um, expression, and they were all monophonic as well. And finally, the recording techniques of the time um, were very limited in, in how many tracks you could record. Um, and initially, it began with, with uh, under eight tracks, but eventually they worked within an eight track um, framework. And when you listen to the record, it sounds like there are you know infinite numbers of tracks instead. Okay, I'm gonna skip ahead here. Electronic music is the poetic and unexpected outcome of paranoid Cold War research, the appropriation and an adaptation of one affect, paranoia, and the development of musical instruments with an electromagnetic capacity to inspire infinite other affects, especially queer and countercultural affects, um, which is where the story gets very, very interesting. It was through messing around with theremins that the young Bob Moog developed his circuit design chops, not only demonstrating the one he built from his own design during his senior year of high school, but even creating a line of Moog theremins available through mail order. Described by Bob Moog as, quote, space control electronic musical instrument, unquote, the theremin represented a symbol of the space age and the space race at once. As the, as the theremin's progeny, Moog's synthesizer design was preoccupied with proximity and touch. Um, and so elsewhere in the book, I go into elaborate kind of discussion of this history um, that produced the theremin, uh, which was um, designed by a Russian um, scientist, Lev Terman, who was creating uh, spy technology, essentially, to um, identify 
uh, within close proximity the presence of the enemy, so to speak. And so it was through um, working with this technology to develop proximity sensors that he created accidentally this instrument that uses the body uh, as a conductor for sound. Um, he, he uses it, he describes it as capacitance. As a theremin's progeny, Moog's synthesizer design was preoccupied with proximity and touch, which continuously emerged as a theme in Bob Moog's musings on the connection that Moog players had with their instruments. Quote, I can feel what's going on inside a piece of electronic equipment, unquote, testifies Bob Moog in the documentary about his life. Uh, this echoes this, uh, the answer he gave to my question that I posed during a Q&A about the difference between analog and digital sound. Quote, all I know is you can feel the difference, he replied. Right? It's like, okay, wow. Um, <laughs> The feeling of sound was something I was deeply preoccupied with, with as Moogstress and as a budding sound studies scholar. The sign, sawtooth, and square waves, the voltage-controlled filters, the modulation of waveforms, these were mere metrics that could not describe what actually happened to me when I played the Moog. Inside Bob Moog's circumspect description, you can feel the difference, was the answer I had been searching for. I could feel sound waves both literally as vibrations moving against and through my body, and as a transmission of electronic affect. As Moogstress, uh, analogs, that's my, that was my very first email address, by the way. As Moogstress, analog sound was my affect. Sure, musicians have testified to a oneness with their instruments for centuries. What's different about the analog synthesizer, you may ask? Quote, it wasn't natural, and therefore it wasn't right. It wasn't the way things should be, unquote. Recalled Bob Moog of the typical response he received to his new contraption when he debuted at trade shows in the 1960s. He was actually chased out of this acoustic society uh, convention uh, because of his contraption was so offensive um, to the other attendees. This was also what I heard as a teenager growing up in the Bible Belt in the late 1980s and early 90s, in the midst of contemplating my budding queerness. Was I hearing the Moog as a queer feeling when I first encountered it only a few years later? In Bob Moog's waxing upon the encounter between the player and the circuit board is implied a form of contact, not unlike the capacitance envisioned by his hero, Terman. Moog suggests that the electromagnetic fields produced by players like Carlos, whose brain waves and heartbeats create electrical pulses, and those produced by synths actually alter one another in a form of synthesis. And I will read, uh, this is uh, concluding this chapter here. What we learn about synthesis through Carlos is that it represents a continuation of a will to shift shape, but in a post-war modern era. Shape shifting is in part a response to the social, environmental, and political climate, a realization that the human body, as well as the category of the human, is a limiting and exclusive container. Shape shifting through sound imagines other futures than the bleak possibilities available in the here and now as she describes in the following, quote, this is Carlos. I used to hate being a composer in the late 20th century. With so few possibilities considered acceptable by much of the music world, it felt like we were all trapped in a little cul-de-sac. But now I barely sleep nights with all the excitement of possibilities becoming real with at least a few computer synthesizers. You no longer have to give up the richness of the acoustic realm or resort to the musique concrète style limits of sampling equipment to be involved with electronic music. After all, we can build new orchestras of bowed timpani. Take notes, everybody. Bowed timpani, percussive French horns, woodwind glockenspiels, metal marimbas, and all the unnamed timbres imaginable that grow naturally out of instrumental power like this. Uh, what a great time to be a composer. Okay, and I'll just read 
Okay, so this is um, the very end of the book. What we learn from SOB and Wendy Carlos's incredible career is that energies and magnetisms are perpetually present and available to work in what scholar and poet Fred Moten has called an ensemble with us. What Wendy Carlos as original synth has exemplified is a life of capacitance, a life lived as a conductor for electromagnetic fields. I'll end on the refrain that has been most resonant for me, quote, that's the trick, the magic of synthesizer tape performance, unquote. This statement encapsulates what was always the most alluring thing about SOB, the analog synthesizer and shape shifting. These are instruments of magic, which have subsequently been put to every imaginable and unimaginable use in every genre of music all over the world. It is the thrill of this magic that continuously brings diehards and new audiences to Wendy Carlos. Thank you. I would um, love to hear any, any thoughts or questions or comments you might have. Okay, that's a, that's a great suggestion. I actually know somebody uh, who, who is writing about her. Um, she worked also with Bob Moog. Um, she was invited to buy, she invited Bob Moog as the only person who was allowed to touch the original theremin that Terman had given her when it needed to be repaired. And he was very afraid to touch it. <laughs> and he took it apart and put it back together and she was not happy with what he had done. And I so... Video, uh, on YouTube years ago, they made, Leon made a birthday cake for her. Oh, wow. Birthday cake. Oh, wow. Wow, yeah. So uh, yeah, she's she's a very interesting character. In fact, many of the well-known theremin players were women, uh, which is something I I talk about in the book. Right, right. Yeah, I have a friend, uh, Tara Rogers, who has a book called Pink Noises, which is all about electronic, uh, women in electronic music. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I that I mean that's one of the most perplexing things because you know so there there was a in, in in some of my musicology friends told me this so it's not something I even knew. Um there was a Bach revival in the late 19th century and you know Bach had been dead for 150 years then and so people were like really gaga over Bach. <laughs> you know, in, in like 1880. Um, and so why this happens again, you know, 80 years later um, is a really interesting question. And uh, the way that Carlos talks about it is that Bach had a very unique um, way of, of expressing sound color, which is a way of describing timbre. Um, and she wanted to be able to use uh, electronic sound synthesis to express sound color. And a lot of the other Moog uh, records um, come across as um, novel, like novelty records. And they they, you know, sound a little bit humorous or, you know, they're meant to be, not all of them, you know, there's, there are a lot of um, very serious attempts too, like Dick Hyman has um, an album that even Carlos was like, that's a serious 
album. The others are not. Um, so, you know, maybe it's because, you know, uh, Western art music is high, high art. And it was one way of legitimating the instrument is to interpret it through this, this form that had already been authorized as, you know, an emblem of, of sophistication and refinement. Um, you know, whereas, of course, country music is the opposite. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm guessing that that's probably why. But I think the way that what's really interesting is that um, the people that Carlos studied with at the Columbia Princeton Electronic Music Center, these were all avant-garde you know, composers. They were making, you know, very, very... So let me see if I can get like a... So that's it, right? Like that, that's, that's, that's my composition. Um, and she was very vehemently um, opposed to a form of music that uh, could not invite an audience in. So she was really committed to um, the audience, actually. And she was also very, when she was working with Moog to develop what would then come to be the, the mini Moog, um, she was really insisting that he think about the musician um, as this person who is going to bring something to the instrument other than just pulling tones out of it. The, the musician is actually going to make it musical. Uh, and so she's committed to this idea of musicality, whereas her colleagues, you know, were very amusical. They were coming out of this tradition um, of basically the, you know, Italian futurist movement that emerged from noise. So noise became a way of rejecting, you know, the, the, the promises of civilization, which were, of course, you know, dashed as a result of World War II, as a result of the Holocaust. So the idea of civilization became this kind of, you know, fantasy that no one believed in anymore. And so noise became the primary sound. And so for Carlos to go to this musical direction was very um, unpopular in, in avant-garde music. And so a lot of her colleagues were kind of like, you know, sort of blowing her off. And of course, soon they weren't blowing her off, um, you know, because she became this just giant celebrity um, in a way that avant-garde music was not producing, you know. And so I think they realized that, wait a minute, you know, avant-garde music may be of interest to the world right now. So I think that the popularity of the album changed, you know, what people thought of avant-garde music at the time. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Sure, that's, that's a great question, and it's like really at the heart of the project. Um, so one of the things that happened in the 19th century because of this first Bach revival um, is that many people decided that uh, they could represent themselves to the world as um, this kind of opulent class that Bach came to represent, okay? And so there was this new um, 
aspirational upper class, you know, mode. Um, and that, that what, what Bach is inspired is um, people having chamber orchestras that would perform in their homes. Uh, affluent people had chamber orchestras that would come. So the very idea of a chamber orchestra, which is a small ensemble, um, it was meant to be a kind of private social event, you know, that would happen in the homes of the affluent. Um, people who aspired to be middle class, they couldn't hire a chamber orchestra. So what did they do? They, they bought a piano and they learned to play it. And so they would invite people to their homes. And so um, the, the symbol of the Victorian woman was the woman who could entertain her, her guests on her own using this piano. Um, and so she stood in for the chamber orchestra and she represented her kind of refined, uh, you know, leisure class through knowing, mastering this instrument. Um, and w what happens with this, this new instrument is this entire new industry forms around it. So you have sheet music form, forming as the very first music, uh, I, I'm sorry, music industry uh, came through sheet music and it was sold to these, these Victorian women. Um, and so once the phonograph became this commodity around the turn of the century, they're, they're selling it to these same women. The phonograph was marketed to uh, the Victorian woman. Um, and so what, what most people don't know about you know, records and, and record players is that they were really designed to be pieces of furniture that go inside of a living room. Um, and so the, the woman of the house was the one who was thought to be bringing all that into her home, the piano, the phonograph, the record player, et cetera. Um, after uh, World War II, a lot of, basically between the First and Second Wars, a lot of this is really altered. And, and I talk about that in the book, um, where, a, you know, Sound becomes one of the primary um, media for military war uh, technology development. Um, and so it, you, whereas it once was kind of this delicate, you know, symbol of, you know, the leisure class, um, it changes to this instrument of, of kind of virility. Um, and this was something that was primarily proposed by the Italian uh, futurists um, through this concept. Um, well, there's a very well-known document. It's a manifesto called The Art of Noise, uh, which pro pro promotes this idea. So um, that's sort of what I chronicle in, in, a, in one of the chapters, is how this instrument goes from being this kind of dainty symbol of refinement to this hard symbol of virility uh, over the, basically through the course of the two world wars. Yeah. So when uh, Carlos was getting her master's degree in electronic music, she, her side hustle was um, to be a sound engineer and she actually engineered a number of records. And so she has, a, you know, she gets credited as being the audio engineer on a number of records. And so um, what Moog started to respond to was Carlos's knowledge about uh, essentially how to construct a recording studio. Um, because of course, this is an instrument that doesn't need to resonate in order to be recorded. You just plug it directly in. And he wasn't thinking about things in that way. And so she was really key to um, developing an instrument that could be recorded in the limited number of tracks that were um, possible at the time. She also, um, she invented um, a uh, 
a, a new sort of a key system for music, um, which has been written about by musicologists as well. She also um, invented a multi, um, I don't know, I don't, I don't even know if this is something that's like, uh, you know, anachronistic or what, but multi-channel audio uh, delivery system um, at a time when it was still just stereo. And so she created this, you know, multi-system audio uh, speaker, you know. Um, she also is a, um, she's a, she, her photographs, of uh, solar eclipses has, have been used by NASA. She, she is a, an award-winning eclipse photographer. So she's an eclipse chaser on top of all these other things. So, um, but I think because of her background in physics, uh, Moog really depended on her to um, kind of interpret him to the world. You know, and so she, she, while she also was a scientist, as a musician, um, I think she spent a lot of time convincing him that certain functions were needed in order for the musician to be able to express um, a kind of musicianship with the instrument. Uh, so they were, they were a really interesting pair. Uh, when you see photos of them together, it's, it's really funny. You know, she's very, very tall and slender and, and kind of, you know, elegant. And he's this kind of, you know, I call him a cotton top grandpa. You know, he's this like, he looks like a Q-tip. Um, so, you know, they were quite a collab collaborative pair. And I think that a lot of, um, he was very, very, um, you know, public about this. He wrote, I mean, he, he, almost every single album she produced, he has written something on the back or in the liner notes. You know, he was really somebody who in the 60s, most, most people who had that kind of um, platform were, were not crediting the others that they collaborated with. You know, so I think, I, I give Moog a lot of credit for, acknowledging how central she was to his his you know research and design process yeah